Today I'm presenting on behalf of a research team, a, a, a multi-institutional research team, uh, Malcolm Sim at Monash University, Tony Lamontagno at Deakin University, Rebecca Lilly at the University of Targo, and Sheila Hogg Johnson who's here. Um, the interpretations I'm putting forward are my own. We haven't discussed it as a research team, so um, blame me, not them. Um, and Christina Dimitriadis is our project coordinator at, and she's based at Monash University in Australia. We also have a number of research partners on this project. Uh, WorkSafe Victoria is our major cash and in-kind supporter. SafeWork Australia, which is a national, uh, a national organisation which oversees uh, workers' compensation in Australia, very similar to the Association of Workers' Compensation Boards of Canada here. The Office of the Age Discrimination Commissioner, uh, Beyond Blue, which is a mental health organisation, and the Australian Industry Group, which is an uh, organisation that represents employers uh, in the Australian system. Uh, and then some other organisations who are involved in this project are the Social Research Centre, who have been conducting our interviews, and the Institute for Safety, Compensation and Recovery Research, which is ISCA. So today I'd like to tell you a little bit about Victoria and about the study, which we're currently undertaking. And I'm going to show you a lot of descriptive results. So unlike, I guess, a lot of um, plenaries, I don't have a specific research question that I'm going to propose and that I'm going to answer. Um, we do think there are differences in the return to work process for psychological injury claims versus musculoskeletal conditions and for older workers versus younger workers. But we don't have specific questions developed, or we do have some, but I'm not going to do that type of presentation today. I'm just going to show you a lot of descriptive results. Um, what I'd like you to do is, as I'm showing you these results, think about what do you think is interesting um, and ask me questions about that at the end or questions of clarification during the plenary, of course. So let me tell you a little bit uh, why I think this is relevant uh, to you today. So traditionally in Canada, most workers' compensation systems have excluded mental health-related conditions unless they're acute reactions to very traumatic events such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Although this is changing, so in 2012, British Columbia has broadened, started to broaden their definition of work-related stress disorders. And then in last year, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeal Tribunal allowed an appeal that the current Ontario Workplace Safety and Insurance Act's restriction of mental health conditions is an infringement on the Charter of Rights. Now in Victoria, workers can lodge claims for psychological injuries, and they have been able to do so for a number of years, uh, which is sustained as a result of chronic stress in the course of their employment. So today you could almost think of this as a look into the future um, in terms of what's going to happen in British Columbia and what potentially might happen in Ontario about what types of issues workers with psychological, broad psychological injuries that are work-related encounter in the work, return to work process. We do know from jurisdictions in Australia that do uh, cover broad psychological injury claims that they do have longer duration of wage replacements and larger uh, direct costs, uh, health care and wage replacement costs than other types of claims and th those differences are quite substantial. And also there's relatively few guidelines for the management of mental health conditions that target occupational health outcomes. Um, this is a recent review which was published in OEM at the start of this year. They found 14 guidelines that talked about return to work with mental health conditions, but only three of those focused on when the condition was a work-related condition. And only um, one of those actually targeted on non-traumatic events in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of the return to work process. And none of those, any of them, were from Canada. Also, age is associated with longer duration of wage replacement in Victoria as well. This is um, some results from a study that Yannick uh, Beriki gissoff did in 2012, which shows this is the median where the lines here meet, the upper 75th percentile, the lower 25th percentile in terms of days of wage replacement. You can see here there's a, a strong relationship between age and days of wage replacement. The interesting thing about Victoria, which I'll get into in a sec, is age is not associated with severity of injury. So a lot of the explanations that we've been looking at in Canada, severity seems to play an important role in Australia. We don't find the same relationship between age and severity, and I'll tell you why in a couple of slides. Actually, I'll tell you why right now. So some other things that make Victoria a little different, and it's important to keep in mind as we go through the presentation. Employers in Victoria are responsible for the first 10 days of wage replacement. So when you get injured, uh, your employer will continue to pay your salary for the first 10 working days after that injury occurs, that you're off work. Um, and then, uh, and then they, report it to the, or they report it to the claims agent, and then the claims agent takes over. 
The management of workers' compensation claims in Victoria is covered by five external agents. So it's not actually covered by WorkSafe Victoria, but they employ five WorkSafe claims agents who cover all, um, all workers' compensation claims in Victoria and they compete for business, they compete to attract different industries uh, to register with them as claims agents. All workplaces with a rateable remuneration of $2 million, so this is based on their payroll, their payroll that they report to the Workers' Compensation Agency. So large employers are required to have a return to work coordinator at all times. And smaller workplaces with less than $2 million are required to appoint a return to work coordinator if an injury occurs in their workplace. Um, the obligation for an employer to provide wage replacement or to provide suitable employment, so to allow somebody to come back to work last for 52 weeks, so for the first year of incapacity, so that's wage replacement, so the first year of wage replacement, which might take longer than a year if people are going on and off work. Uh, and wage replacement will continue for 130 weeks, and after that point, um, it's very hard to continue wage replacement, although it does happen. And finally, one of the key differences is um, Workers' compensation claimants can sue for damages. So there's a common law system which operates in Victoria where you can sue for damages for injuries that are serious. Um, so serious could be based on a medical diagnosis or it also could be based on a narrative assessment of what's happening to your life uh, because of your injury. Usually that occurs around 18 months after the injury it occurs where the narrative assessment starts to take place. And either of those claims can go through a common law system for, um, for damages. So a little bit different here where we have a complete no-fault system. So our current project, which we're undertaking at the moment, is to understand the return to work process for workers' compensation claimants in Victoria. This is the first large-scale cohort study that's been conducted on workers' compensation claimants in Australia. And our focus is on two, we have two particular foci. One is to examine the return to work process for psychological claimants compared to those with musculoskeletal injuries. Almost everything we know about return to work is based on musculoskeletal conditions and we know very little about what happens when people don't have a musculoskeletal condition in terms of cohort studies. Um, older workers, uh, so we also want to compare older workers who are 55 years and older to younger workers as well because that's a, certainly an interest of um, uh, WorkSafe Victoria and also for my, many uh, compensation jurisdictions given the increasing age of the labour market. So we have a longitudinal cohort of workers' compensation claimants. We interview them as soon as possible after a claim is accepted and then we interview them again at six months post the baseline interview, then again at 12 months post the baseline interview. So those interviews are six months apart. Our initial target was to recruit 960 claimants, assuming that we'd have a 40% attrition over time which would leave us with about 576 claimants. Uh, at the 12-month mark, we would have complete information. So let me tell you a little bit about the recruitment process because this is important to keep in mind when we start presenting the results because these results are not like uh, results you might have seen before for, say, from the readiness for return to work cohort or the early claimant cohort because of certain things around uh, the compensation process. So at the top left here, an injury occurs. We don't know the number of days between when the injury occurs and when the, the worker first registers an incapacity. So to register an incapacity, the worker sees a general practitioner and they say, I feel like because of this I'm unable to work. The general practitioner will write them a certificate of incapacity that can last for 14 days. Um, and at that point they can take their, well, they're, they're registered as part of the system and that's when the clock starts in terms of the 10 days of compensation before they can submit a uh, standard worker's compensation claim. So at least 10 days will pass and then they'll submit the claim. WorkSafe um, gives themselves up to 28 days to make a decision about whether the injury is work-related or not. For psychological injury claims, they always take the full 28 days. They never respond to an adjudication before 28 days. That's just an internal process that they have. Um, so the claim adjudication is accepted. So the way we were recruiting is every month WorkSafe Victoria would do a random sample of claimants and they would send that to the social research centre who were doing our interviews. So that could be anywhere if a claim was at the very end of the month, that could be only a week. If the claim was at the start of the month, it could be up to 30 days. So we've got another 30 days here before that contact information is sent to the social research centre. The social research centre then sent out a primary approach letter 
from Worksite Victoria, inviting people to be part of the study, and an information sheet from Monash University, just to tell them a little bit more about the study and walk them through um, the informed consent. And that can take up to seven days for those letters to be sent out. And then uh, we have to wait 21 days before we attempt to contact the claimants. And that's to enable people, um, there's a reply, a snail mail reply paid envelope, which is given with the package, so that people can opt out either on the internet uh, by calling a 1800, which is a 1300 number in Australia, and uh, or they can send a signed snail mail response back. And so we allow 21 days, and then the Social Research Centre attempts to contact the claimant, and they'll attempt to contact them for up to two months. Yes. So the 28 days with these uh, private insurers, um, do, do they all take 28 days? No. no the mental health claims always take 28 days. For each of the insurers, do all the mental health claims, they all for each of the insurers that happens? Or is it, is so WorkSafe is, policy, yeah, so that's a policy that they always take the full 28 days. Just to, um, so what WorkSafe would probably tell you is, is just to see if the condition, the condition might settle down. Um, it might, may no longer be an issue around workers' compensation. Um, these are complex situations, so the adjudication does take some time. Um, but it's, as I said, it's gen as a general rule of thumb, it's 28, 28 days. Um, Musculoskeletal conditions or other conditions can be, the decision can be made a lot quicker. Yep. In terms of this submit, the, med, the mental health and medical professionals, is it general physicians that are saying yes, we trust and it's related to work or psychologists? So usually the first point of contact would be a general practitioner. Um, they may refer straight away to a psychologist who may write the initial certificate of incapacity. I don't, we do have information on that, but I don't, I don't know what that, what that is right now. But that's the sort of question which we could look into. Thanks. Any other questions about this sort of recruitment process? No? Um, so our current progress, so at the moment we've completed our baseline survey, surveys, all of them. It took us a year to complete because um, we were only, so what happened is, uh, Right as we were about to start recruitment, we were going to recruit heavily over a six-month period. Um, but at that particular point, WorkSafe changed. They do a client satisfaction survey, which, and they used to do it twice yearly, uh, which is it ties into how they remunerate the claims agents based on satisfaction. And they'd noticed that claims activity was very high in the month just before each of those surveys that occurred twice every year. So they moved those surveys to a monthly survey. So now activity is very high all the time, which is good um, for them. And so we got a smaller sample. So it took us a year to recruit our sample. Our response rate was 53%. Um, we wanted to have 20% of our claims being psychological injury claims to assess differences, and we got 22%. And we wanted 20% to be 55 years and older, and we got 21%. Uh, so we were selective in terms, we had a stratified target in terms of uh, our sample. 91% of our population, or our claimant population, have agreed to link their initial baseline responses to their administrative claims information. So this gives us information on the incapacity date, uh, the date their uh, claim was originally submitted, uh, when wage replacement started. It gives us all the services they've received by WorkSafe, all the payments that WorkSafe has made uh, as a result of their injury, and they're all detailed, they're all itemised. Um, so it's a great resource, and so we also have information on the medical certificates as well. Who wrote the medical certificate? How long was it for? Um, and then 98% agreed to be recontacted after six months which is great. And a six month follow up, so far, as of the start of September, we've completed 468 interviews. Um, a 74% response rate, this is a little bit lower um, than it really is because, as I said, the, the um, process of trying to contact claimants goes for a two month period. And so the claims that are due to be recontacted, we will be trying to recontact them. And what we usually see is the response rates a little bit higher uh, at the end than it is during the survey. Um, but when we do contact the claimants, when we manage to make contact, 96% agree to do the six-month interview. Um, we have a modified survey. It's a smaller survey. It's about 30 minutes. Um, and I'll tell you about how it's different from the baseline in just a second. And then the 12 month, as of September, we have 138 interviews completed, a 60% response rate. Again, that's a little bit lower uh, than it truly is because it takes a while to contact all the claimants. And it, again, it's 97% when we make contact with the claimants. So our, our retention. Uh, when we make contact is, is going very well. And so there are two ways that we want to look at um, injury and age, injury type and age in terms of return to work and recovery. 
The first is, uh, is depicted in this top diagram, which is we know that age and injury type or older age and psychological claims are associated with poorer return to work and recovery outcomes. And we want to try and understand, well, what is it? What is modifiable in that pathway that we might be able to look at in terms of changing around explaining why we see longer duration of wage replacement or worse recovery outcomes among older workers or injury types? So are there particular parts of the return to work process which are modifiable and that sort of mediate or explain part of this relationship? Um, the second way we want to look at age and injury type is, so we have important predictions of return to work. We know from previous work that certain things are important in the return to work process, things like um, contact, uh, the work, the, uh, the contact by the workplace, the healthcare provider discussing a return to work date, um, the uh, initial response to the injury by the workplace. You know that these things are important. What we want to understand is, um, does their importance differ by age or by injury type? So for example, um, is workplace contact, is it more important for older workers versus younger workers? Is it more important for people with psychological injury claims than for musculoskeletal conditions? And this helps us um, potentially uh, start to focus on if we need uh, injury-specific or age-specific return to work um, programs or, or procedures that occur following an injury. Because if certain things are important for older workers but not for younger workers, it makes sense to include those things in a, a program that's targeting older workers but not to include them in a program that's targeting younger workers. Today, I'm going to present information just about this first, this first part. So I'm going to show you a bunch of slides which talk about differences in factors that we think are important in the return to work and recovery process and how they differ by age and by injury type. So I'm not going to present everything about our baseline survey today. This is the information for those of you who are sitting up the back. Um, the bars down the bottom here are healthcare provider interactions, employment commitment and meaning of work and wrap up any issues. But you can see we ask a variety of information. Um, the interview was just under 40 minutes. We asked them about um, their basic job information, the reaction to their injury, the current workplace, working status. Um, we asked them things around contact by the workplace, interactions with their return to work coordinator, interactions with their claims agent, their perceived fairness of the return to work process. We asked them about their functioning, all sorts of information about their, their pre-injury work environment and their pre-injury workability, um, mental health questions, physical function questions, general health questions, um, self-efficacy to return to work, which um, is, has been more recently shown to be quite an important predictor in the return to work process, and different workplace characteristics. In terms of the uh, the follow-up surveys, we do ask a lot of the same information. We don't ask information about uh, their, their uh, pre-injury duties or their pre-injury work environment, uh, their workability, because we already have that information. Um, we did remove a few uh, qu questions around the workplace reaction to the injury because, again, those things have passed. And we have included questions around sleep. Uh, we heard in our baseline surveys that sleep was very important. It's a very important... Uh, the impact on sleep was something which was very important to a lot of the people we spoke to. And we've also asked about um, uh, disagreements uh, between the claimant and the claims agent and if those disagreements have been resolved and also if they've started speaking to lawyers. And so that information, yeah, sure. How long has the baseline survey been for the 12 months. <laughs> oh, is in how long? Four? How long would it take somebody to finish it? 40 minutes, just, un just under 40 minutes. And the follow-ups are just under 30 minutes. So one of the things we're interested in at the very start is to compare, well, so we have a 53% response rate. How similar is our sample to the source population? So we know, because WorkSafe was sending um, the, the claim information to the Social Research Centre, we actually know who exactly our source population is. And uh, at an aggregate level, so WorkSafe doesn't want to provide any information and it wouldn't be ethical to provide too much information to us about who didn't respond to the survey. Uh, but at the aggregate level, we can see that um, our survey, our sample, which is the red bars and the source population, which is the blue bars, are quite similar in terms of, um, in terms of sex. Um, females slightly more represented in our sample uh, than males and that's uh, than in terms of the source population. And that's fairly typical in terms of any survey content where males are less likely to respond to surveys than, um, than females. In terms of the age distribution, again, the age distribution looks fairly similar. 
and the distribution of injury type again looks quite similar as well. And this is something which we were quite concerned about at the start is that we wanted to make sure that we were recruiting um, psychological claimants uh, which were representative of all psychological claimants and um, we're feeling a little bit more confident that we've achieved that. For those, oh, oh what have I done? For those who have agreed to provide um, the administrative data, we can look at their industry of employment and compare that to the industry of the source population. So here you can see we, are, we do have good representation across all industry groups in our sample, slightly more represented in terms of occupations such as healthcare, uh, which is a female dominated occupation. Um, we have less, uh, slightly underrepresented in male dominated occupations such as manufacturing, transport, um, construction, uh, but we still have representatives or claimants uh, who are in each of those industries. And so how soon are we getting people uh, at our baseline interview? How far are they into the return to work process? And so I've got three different indicators, four different indicators here. The blue bars is the time since they self-reported that their injury occurred. So we asked them in the initial survey, uh, how, long, how long ago was your injury? And they told us in days, weeks or months. Um, the red bars is the time since the injury from the administrative data. So when you submit a claim form to WorkSafe, you have to fill in an affliction date, which is the date the injury occurred. The blue is the time since incapacity, so that's the initial incapacity start date. Um, and then the green bar is the time since claim submission, so the date the form was sent uh, and received by their claims agent. And so um, you can see for, in terms of when the process really starts for us, which is after the claim, so once the claim is submitted, it then has to be approved, which takes a month. We then get that information to the social research center, which takes about a month, and then we try and recruit, which takes approximately a month to uh, two months. So you can see that we are getting most of our sample, about 80% of our sample from the claim submission, we're getting them within about four months. Um, but if you think back to the other parts of the process, it's, it's a long, much longer time if you start to think about things when they first thought their injury occurred, between when they put that down on the claim form, between when they were first incapacitated or had to day, take a day off work. And we'll be starting, we can look at all these different factors in terms of when we start to examine our results um, to take into account lags in each of these different processes. So working status, a baseline interview. So I'm going to, most of the slides from here on in are going to follow very, a very similar format. First I'm going to present musculoskeletal versus psychological injury claims. Musculoskeletal claims will always be blue. Psychological claims will always be red. Um, and so you can see here in terms of working status at the baseline interview, um, if you focus on the right hand side of the slide, psychological injury claimants were much more likely not to have returned to work and have not been back at all. However, when you look at those who are back at work and working in the same job, there isn't actually the same difference in terms of injury type. And in fact, most of the differences are around the fact that musculoskeletal conditions were much more likely to be, have returned to work and be working in some type of modified job. And we'll come back to this point around modified duties and offers of accommodation throughout the presentation. The next slides I'll present, and orange is always workers less than 35 years of age, green is always 35 to 54, and gray is always 55 plus. Um, so we look at age group again, we can see, as we would have expected, focusing on the right hand side, older workers are more likely not to be, not to be back at work, a graded relationship by age, although the differences in terms of younger workers and, um, and those who are 35 plus is that younger workers are much more likely to be back at work working their same job. So already sort of, I guess, interesting differences at baseline, although given this is quite a long way into the claim process. In terms of the impact of injury, this is just the impact of injury uh, in general across all claimants. You can see that um, a few of our claimants, about you know, sort of uh, approximately 30% of our claimants are still feeling disabled most of the time or all the time, angry and frustrated or feeling dependent upon others. Uh, so people haven't recovered uh, from their injury. There is differences across injury type in terms of feeling angry and frustrated with those with psychological injury claims more likely to report feeling angry and frustrated most of the time or all of the time compared to other claimants. When we look at um, serious mental illness, which we've taken using the K6, which is a psychological inventory based of six questions at the baseline interview, as we would expect, there are differences across injury type. 45% of those with psychological injury claims uh, have a serious mental illness, but 22% of those with musculoskeletal conditions also have what we would call a serious mental illness. 
Um, and then a different relationship by age with it, more common among the youngest workers um, than the older workers. So certainly secondary psychological conditions are an interesting part of this cohort that we can examine. So I'd just like to cover a few things that we think are important, which is where I'm going to focus the rest of the presentation. So things which, in terms of talking with our, with our partners, um, the healthcare provider, we'd like to see the healthcare provider in the return to work process discussing what the worker can and cannot do. And WorkSafe Victoria's had a, a big push in the last year or so um, around for healthcare providers to talk to claimants about what they can do even if it's not part of their job. So just any type of activity because if you could do something, even if it's part of your job, it might help in terms of discussions with your workplace because maybe there is a job where you could do those things. Um, and we hope that they talk to the worker about when they will return to work, give them a date. We know that having a date to return to work um, is a good indicator of return to work even if that date is not, um, in, not sort of coming up. We hope that the workplace makes contact with the worker. We hope they have a return to work coordinator because they're... Um, legislatively they have to, and we hope that they provide an offer of modified or alternative duties or some type of return to work plan which helps the worker come back to work. Um, we hope that the healthcare provider, the worker and the workplace are all in contact with each other. We hope there's communication happening in the system. We hope that the claims agent is treating the worker with respect and is providing the worker with the information that they need. Um, we hope that all partners in the return to work process, healthcare provider, return to work coordinator and claims agent aren't creating stress. We know that when, uh, when the return to work process is stressful, it will always take longer. Uh, and we think, hope that the worker believes that they can and that they will return to work. So, the worker. So again, I'm going to just present the next few in the same pattern and then I'm going to skip the animation. So when we think about, we ask respondents if they thought they'd return to work. How likely is it, is it, how likely is it that you think you'll return to work? And most respondents thought they would. There is a difference here for psychological injury claims and musculoskeletal conditions. 60% of psychological injury claims thought it would be very likely uh, compared to just over 70% of musculoskeletal conditions. No differences, no statistical differences by age group, although you can see here that certainly older workers um, were lower in terms of thinking it was very likely that they would return to work. This is just return in general. We asked them, well, for those who uh, were not on pre-injury duties, we said to them, how, how likely is it do you think you'll return to your pre-injury duties? And we had less, people were less confident they could return to their pre-injury duties. So again, we have differences uh, between injury type, with psychological injury claimants feeling it was less likely that they would return to their pre-injury duties. And older workers, um, here is interesting that we don't see the same relationship between age and the difference is actually that younger workers think it's not as likely they'll return to their pre-injury duties. Now this could be something about uh, the labour market um, sort of trajectory of younger workers compared to older workers, so they don't think they'll return to this job, they might return to a, a different job. We haven't unpacked that yet. Recovery expectations, when we ask them how long, like how's your recovery going, how long do you think it'll take you to recover? Uh, they didn't differ by injury type or by age group. Most people thought they'd get better slowly, about 60% thought they'd get better slowly, uh, with fewer people saying they'd get better soon, they'd never get better or they were already recovered. So workplace factors. So psychological and younger claimants were more likely to have a negative supervisor response to their injury. Good news is that about 50% of claimants report a positive response to the injury. So these are things like you know, was empathetic, was concerned about you, wanted you to file a claim. Um, negative responses are things like blamed you for the injury, didn't believe you were injured, um, didn't want you to file a claim. Um, and mixed responses are when people have both. They have sort of negative and positive responses. And neutral is where they say, yeah, there was no response. It was just nothing. Um, so certainly psychological injury claims are more likely than musculoskeletal to have this negative response to their injury. Yes. This is when we spoke to them, yes. But at the first yes, so we said, uh, when you first got injured, what was, your super, what was the reaction of your supervisor? Do you have any information on the distribution of the types of psychological disorders? And is it mostly post-traumatic stress disorder or mostly not? So in the system, it's about 80% psychological stress. It's about 12%, uh, which is post-traumatic stress, like, and about 8% is um, like things like anxiety, schizophrenia, um, panic disorders. Um, yeah. So, and we do have that in our data for those who have agreed to link. 
uh, and by age group as well. But it was younger climbers who reported more negative responses uh, from, their, from their supervisor in terms of their injury um, than older. And in fact, older workers were more likely to report positive responses in general. So now I'm going to stop the animation, but you can see it's always the same. Psychological climbers are also more likely to have negative co-worker responses to their injury. So this is, you know, where their co-worker blamed them, the co-worker was angry, they were frustrated that they were injured. Um, psychological climbers, much more likely. In fact, it rarely happened for musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, but psychological climbers, it was about 15% of them. Mixed responses, also more common among psychological climbers. With, psych with positive responses, um, again, more common in those with musculoskeletal conditions and more common among older workers. 72% of claimants have been contacted by the workplace, which is not bad. Um, didn't differ by injury type or age. We also looked into return to work status. That doesn't seem to impact it either. Um, but there still is, you know, a, a sizable proportion, almost 30% of claimants who have not been contacted. And we're talking, you know, we're now two to three months into the injury process and no contact has been made by the workplace. Um, the importance of receiving contact did differ by um, age group, but not by injury type. And we found that older workers, when we said, how important was it for you to receive the contact, older workers were more likely to say, you know, receiving that was very important to me compared to uh, younger climbers, but no differences by injury type. Um, climbers with psychological injuries were less likely to have been contacted by the workplace's return to work coordinator. So. Here we have three categories. On the left is the designated person has been in contact. In the middle is there's a designated person, but they haven't been in contact. And on the far right is there's no designated person. Uh, now this could be because they don't know that there is a designated person. Um, but we can see here that psychological injury claimants were, were less likely to have been contacted by the return to work coordinator. Um, this isn't a function of, of uh, business size. Psychological claims are more likely in larger workplaces although the contact is a function of business size. So smaller workplaces are less likely to have a designated person than larger workplaces. So this is, um, these differences are probably larger than they really are at the moment. Sorry, they're smaller than they really are at the moment because psychological crimes are in larger workplaces. Psychological climates and older workers are less likely to have been offered and have accepted a an offer of modified duties. So on the left here we have the percent of people who have been offered modified duties and have accepted it, you can see huge differences there by injury type and smaller differences, but important ones by age group. Um, and in terms of, on the far right is no offer of modified duty. In the middle, uh, people who have been offered duties and, and have declined the duties. And you, again, you see this large difference by injury type in terms of there's been an offer made, but it's been declined. And so we asked people, why, why didn't you accept uh, this first offer of accommodation? Um, and people often responded that the job wasn't changed enough, that was more common among musculoskeletal conditions. The job offered wasn't meaningful or challenging, only occurred among psychological injury claimants. 20%, one in five of them said that was the reason they rejected the offer because it, was, it wasn't a meaningful offer of employment. Um, no modification was, was required, they thought they could return to work, they didn't need it. And then we have a sizable chunk in other. Um, this group is, we've got verbatim responses for each of these, for the people who reported other. Um, we've had a quick scan of those. About 30% of them indicate that people have been told not to return to work by their treating healthcare provider. So a doctor doesn't think it's a good idea or a surgeon said just wait. Um, and about 37% is because they're worried about getting re-injured. And then there's another assortment of responses. Um, for those who are currently off work, less than 30% had a return to work plan. And this didn't differ by age or injury type. Now, you know, there's a little bit of debate when we presented this to our partners. They were like, well, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to know if they've been given a plan. It might be something formal, like, you know, here's the plan. I'm going to write it out for you. It might just be, here's a, let's have a phone call, like, let's talk about stuff. Um, each of them have, have sort of considered it currently to be a plan, but um, uh, certainly 30% of them, or 70% of people don't know of the plan, even if the workplace does. So the healthcare provider. So healthcare providers often discussed activities that respondents uh, can do. So this was, you know, has your work healthcare provider discussed with you 
what you can do, even if it's not part of your job, and we had more than 80% of people saying yes, that has occurred. A small difference here in terms of discussing things that respondents shouldn't do, um, only by injury type, I'm not really sure what that's about. It might just be more that it's easier to provide advice with a musculoskeletal condition about please avoid these types of activities, rather than a psychological injury condition where it's like, please avoid interacting with you know, this person, this person, that person. Um, older claimants and psychological injury claimants were less likely to have been given a return to work date. So this is, so no differences in terms of having discussions about return to work, although a little bit lower in those who are older. Um, but in terms of being given a return to work date and being given a date when you're likely to perform your pre-injury duties, you see differences here by injury type and by age group, um, where um, psychological claimants and older workers are less likely to have been given either of those two pieces of information by their healthcare provider. 69% of claimants said their healthcare provider has contacted their employer or their occupational rehabilitation agent. Um, however, there was a slight difference in terms of the importance of contact, although in general, when we ask people, how important do you think it is for your healthcare provider in your workplace to be talking about the return to work process? Um, you know, almost 70% of people said, yeah, it's, it's very important, uh, with another handful saying it's important. So, Small difference here by injury type, although it's not as large as some of the differences we've seen uh, before. But certainly uh, doing this is something that workers are not uh, opposed to, most workers are not opposed to. So the case manager, it's a tour de force. 86% um, of claims reported contact with their case manager from their claims agent. Now this is very strange in that this should be 100%. Um, so we don't know whether this is some sort of recall bias or not. Um, we know that change in a case manager is also related to potentially longer duration of wage replacement, and we have 38% of our sample where they've reported that the claims manager has changed, uh, and so we can start to look at these factors and how that they impact uh, the return to work process, but there were no differences in either of these by age or by injury type. So finally, stress in the return to work process. So psychological claimants reported more stress in their interactions with their healthcare provider. And this is, um, we asked them what was the cause of this stress, and this is mainly just recalling the situation, so recalling the process whereby they got injured, recalling aspects of the work environment about how it led to their injury. And I was saying these are the things that lead to stress. And so we can see that psychological claimants, which is on the right, and the next two slides after this are all the same. So not at all stressful is on the left, up to quite a bit are extremely on the right. So this is the healthcare provider. Uh, the return to work coordinator. So you can see here that psychological claimants also find it more stressful to deal with their return to work coordinator, but younger claimants were the ones that found it more stressful interacting with their return to work coordinator than, than older claimants. Um, and you can see here the size uh, goes up, so we have more people on the right than we had for the healthcare providers. And again, in terms of um, the case manager, again, psychological claimants were more likely to find this interaction stressful, and again, younger workers were more likely to say, or well, certainly not necessarily less than 35, but those who weren't 55 were more likely to report that this was a stressful, uh, that these interactions were stressful. And so when we started this process, we were, we were thinking about that older respondents would be more likely to say that their age has somehow influenced decision making in the return to work process, that because they were older, that they got treated differently and, you know, we were open to the fact that this could be positive or this could be negative, but we thought it'd potentially be more negative than positive and that, you know, because they're older, they'd be treated differently. And so we asked people um, if they thought that their age had influenced the decision making by their healthcare provider or by their return to work coordinator or by their um, claims agent. And it was the younger claimants that said their age was influencing the decisions which were being made about them. We do see it's sort of a U-shaped relationship here. So healthcare provider being the blue, um, return to work coordinator being the red, claims agent being the purple, and you see that the group most likely to say that this person's decision making was, uh, their, their age has influenced their thinking, was around, um, was more common in the younger respondents. And most of this is around the younger respondents felt like they were being forced back to work much earlier than they wanted to go back because they were young. Because people were like, you know, you're fine, just, You'll recover, you'll go back. Um, we just see a blip there in the older age groups as well. So, summarising. 
So new findings about the return to work process in Victoria, which our study is currently providing, and it'll provide a lot more, we hope, over time. Most workers believe they return to work, 69%, although fewer at this stage in our baseline interview thought they returned to their pre-injury duties. And there were differences with psychological injuries, people with psychological injuries being the most apprehensive about being able to return to work or about their return to their pre-injury duties, uh, with most workers thinking that their injury will get better slowly. Um, concerning the workplaces, so psychological injury claimants certainly experience more negative reactions from co-workers and supervisors following their injuries. We have looked at how the reactions influence uh, the current return to work status at baseline, and certainly negative responses are very, very important uh, in terms of uh, return to work status. Those that had a negative response from their supervisor were twice as likely not to be back at work compared to those that had uh, a positive response. Most claimants report the contact with their report having contact with their workplace, and older workers placed more importance in receiving this contact. Um, psychological and older claimants were less likely to have been offered and accepted modified duties, and this is actually something we've also seen in, in the um, not for around psychological, but around older claimants. We've seen this uh, in the readiness for return to work study as well, where older workers were less likely to be offered and have, have accepted an offer of modified duties. Um, psychological claimants were less likely than musculoskeletal claimants to have had contact with their workplaces return to work coordinator, so there's sort of been a sort of a shutdown. Um, so they're off work, getting compensation, but they're not getting any communication. And less than 30% of claimants who are off work currently thought they had a return to work plan. Uh, concerning healthcare providers, um, good news is that I guess the push to start talking to people about what they should do, even if it's not part of their duty, seems to be working. 80% of people report that this is happening. Um, although our older claimants and those with psychological injuries are not being given uh, dates that they'll return to work. So there's not that discussion about, oh, I think you'll be back at work by this date and you'll be back at your pre-injury duties by this date. Um, and then older claimants are also less likely to even have a discussion about return to work with their physicians or their healthcare providers. Concerning stress, um, psychological claims reported much more stress in the return to work process and um, you can guess that this is probably going to be an important factor going forward. We've started looking at what, um, what sort of factors influence uh, stress because we uh, have questions around, you know, were you treated with respect? Have people been communicating with you? Do you think the return to work process is prejudiced or biased against you? And these partially explain it, but there's uh, still a relationship after we adjust for these factors. And so um, it's going to be interesting as we start to explore what are the things that, that tend to predict stress occurring and then what is the impact of stress after that point on return to work. And then claimants perceive that their age influences decisions which have been made about them, but it's younger workers who are the most likely to perceive that it's their age which is influencing decision making. So, that's it. That's all I've got to say today. Um, I'm happy to take questions and comments. Thank you.